Well, actually, not all is bad news about the quality of life. But, but I think anyone who has had Cushing's recovered, for, is recovering, or has recovered, and family members know that it's, it's, um, it's quite a challenge. I always should, again, start with mini G. Now, <clears throat> we've been through this, so I'll go very quickly just to make sure we have the terminology correct. As was mentioned earlier, Cushing's syndrome just means too much steroid. Most common is either pills or injections. Cushing's disease refers to the pituitary tumor. And <clears throat> when I discuss today the uh, quality of life studies, and I'm going to show you some data as opposed to just opinions of mine, um, most of those studies will include patients with both types, adrenal tumor, pituitary tumor, and it really doesn't matter. Because remember, the bottom line is too much cortisol. So it's just a small distinction. <clears throat> so the real issue is it's sort of like what the uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice said when asked to define pornography. He said, well, I don't know, but I know it when I see it, right? <laughs> well, so what is quality of life? And all of us have our own perceptions. Um, I wouldn't mind having a diamond tiara. That would be a nice thing to have. Some people might want a yacht or whatever. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is we do have valid measures, so I'm going to try to keep to fairly scientific stuff today. <clears throat> One issue that's dawned on me, and this is from seeing so many patients, <clears throat> what's the problem with how is this problem made worse by a delay in diagnosis? Well, we don't have hard data, but I think it's common sense. The longer a patient has had this disorder, the more difficult it is and the bigger impact on their quality of life. And the final issue, which I'll try to address, is what are some outcomes of treatment on quality of life? You all know this, but this fits into some of the testing parameters. There are emotional symptoms, depression, memory loss, irritability, problems with concentration, crying spells, sleep disturbance, waking up every half an hour at night, and some people feeling wired, this sort of feeling hyper on st with steroids. And the physical symptoms, you know, again, weight gain, fatigue, muscle weakness, puffiness, edema, the bruising, the thin skin, the purple stretch marks, facial hair, rounding of your face, hair loss. Now, <clears throat> these are like the textbook listings of features of Cushing's. Now, the good news is most patients do not have all of those. The bad news is they have some of them. So my, I was thinking about that list, and I said, OK, <clears throat> which things on this list would impact on their quality of life? So I made this slide. Anything in green would impact on their quality of life. <laughs> So while there's a spectrum of clinical features and severity, I think all of these things, you know, if a woman is growing a beard, that obviously is going to, she's not going to want to go out smiling around because of Cushing's or gaining weight or all of these things. <clears throat> now, I do want to talk about the delay in diagnosis because we have fairly hard data that actually supports exactly what happened to Louise. We did a, per, a survey in our pituitary clinic, and we had 237 patients with proven Cushing's. It was a very simple survey. We asked the question, how long did you have symptoms before you were diagnosed with Cushing's? And I think it's pretty awful to say that most of them, this is three to five years, that was 36% of our patients. Five to 10 years, quarter of our patients. That's really depressing, but that's also a reality. Again, because other things are treated, the depression, the high blood pressure, the diabetes, people told to lose weight and not evaluated. So unfortunately, there is a delay in diagnosis, which of course is going to impact on every parameter, including quality of life. I think Louise is over here in plus 12. 
But we asked the other question, how many doctors did you consult? And again, over half of our patients had to see two or four doctors before the issue of Cushing's was brought up. 20% saw five to eight doctors. So again, it's a reality that there is a delay. Now, I thought this was interesting because we now have the internet and we have friends. And we ask, who suggested that you might have Cushing's? The primary care physician or internist, that was only a third. And remember, that's the first line. That's who most people see, their family doctor or their internist. So they get their depression and their high blood pressure and their diabetes treated, but no evaluation. <clears throat> the other interesting group was self from reading, which would have been either books or, or internet, and that was about 16%. This 20% says other, well, those were other specialties, like dermatology or GYN. Well, no, there's actually a GYN group in there. So look at it, and family and friend. Louise, this is your friend, right? 12% of people say something's not right. So just to let you know. Now, let's talk about how we assess quality of life. <clears throat> there's a test called the SF36. It's got 36 questions, which is why it's called 36. <laughs> and it is a very good validated health survey. The nice thing about it is, it, well, one of the things, it's not disease specific, so it's not biased toward or against one type of disease. So you can compare the relative burden of a disease or different diseases and their response to treatment, and it's all compared to normal people. And so we use that, and I'll show you some information on that. When we started looking at quality of life measures in patients with pituitary problems, the Notting <coughs> Nottingham Health Profile was used, and that's from Nottingham, England. Now, there was a problem. When we used that in one of our studies, we, one of the questions was, I don't feel like walking to the tea shop. Now, who walks anywhere in the United States and nobody goes to the tea shop, right? <laughs> Maybe to the mall, but not the tea shop. And Starbucks. Yeah, we could change that. So anyway, that's, they're all valid, but some are better than others. One other very good test is the Beck Depression Index, which again assesses depressive symptoms so associated with Cushing's. But again, it's not good just to do a survey. It's long-term follow-up to see the changes that are important. So <clears throat> SF36, I'm going to talk about that because I want to show you some data that we did and published. It addresses eight different uh, health issues, both physical and mental issues. The scores are compared with the normal population. And I'll be showing you some graphs. So a normal population average score is 50. So that's the good news. And then they, we also can do mental and physical summary scores. <clears throat> this is a study we did in 168 patients who had different types of pituitary tumors, Cushing's, acromegaly, prolactin tumors, non-functioning. And you can see the numbers there. Uh, we had 42 people with Cushing's, 51 with non-functioning. It's very simple. We did this during clinic. Huh, the title's not there. All right, what I want you to look at, first of all, the, the blue group are the Cushing's patients right here. Now, <clears throat> some of this did not transmit, but 50 is the normal score, and anything below that is worse. So looking at the physical summary, you can see that Cushing's patients compared with patients with acromegaly or prolactin tumors or non-functioning tumors are much worse off physically and also mentally. Those of us who treat these patients know this, but out there in the medical community, it's not well known. They don't understand that this high cortisols definitely affects more than just weight gain and high blood pressure, but it, it affects the total life, particularly the mental functioning. Oh, there it is. 
So the Cushing's patients had significantly poorer quality of life than patients with other types of tumors. And this looks at each aspect of, of the studies. So if you look at the bottom here, these are just Cushing's patients compared with the normal population. Physical function, physical accomplishments, body pain, general health, vitality, social function, emotional and mental health. So here's the normal population and these are our Cushing's patients. And uh, compared with the non-functioning tumors, which are in blue, you can see the Cushing's patients score lower, which means they're worse off than people with a large tumor that doesn't make any hormones. And that just compares the domains, the mental summary here, the physical summary. Again, the Cushing's are in red and they do worse. So I think it's pretty obvious there's a decreased quality of life in patients with Cushing's compared with both the normal population <coughs> and patients with a different type of pituitary tumor. Someone asked earlier about personality and personality changes. I'm not an expert in personality, but there are questionnaires and analyses of different types of personalities. And this is from a this study is from a very good group in Italy. And they looked at 24 normal patients, normal subjects, and 24 patients with Cushing's. And there was a special tri-dimensional personality questionnaire. So the real issue is, and I've had this from my patients, am I just crazy? What's gone on with me? What's happened to me? So they wanted to see if patients with Cushing's, even though they had all these symptoms, do they actually have different or weird or abnormal personalities compared with the normal population? And using this objective test, and it's very comforting, I think, they were able to, able to show that there was no difference in their personality dimensions compared with normal people. So even though people with Cushing's develop all the emotional symptoms that are so disturbing, their personalities are not wacky. There's nothing wrong with their personalities. And I think that people ought to be aware of that because so many patients are worried that they're losing their mind or that something, you know, they're not the same person they used to be. The underlying personality is still there, even if you're experiencing a lot of the emotional consequences of Cushing's. There's also, well, they also did this symptom rating test. Well, this is no surprise. Their symptoms were, look, this was that same study from the Italians showing that the Cushing's patients had worse scores Com compared with normal people for anxiety, depression, psychotic symptoms, and generalized quality of life. These are, after almost 30 years doing this, my own observations are that because of this uh, impact on their quality of life, that recovery takes so long, usually a year, and that patients are frustrated by the slow rate of recovery you expect to feel better immediately and you're not. Expect to lose weight immediately and you don't. And again, the slower, the more severe the effects, the slower the recovery. Our younger subjects tend to get better faster, which makes sense. I mean, as with aging, no, no one recovers as fast as when they were 25. What about treatment? Now these are patients with both pituitary or adrenal, not both, with pituitary or adrenal Cushing's. So this was a study looking at how, what happened to their treatment and how did they recover. So they were asking this through a questionnaire. And you can see there were a total of 74 patients. 62 completed the questionnaire. And after their treatments, only 46 felt fully recovered 30% did not, and 23% were unsure. Now, these are subjective, but then what else do we have to go by? It's not like we have a blood test for how you feel. But th I think this is an important observation here. It's the same group of patients. After <clears throat> successful treatment, 81% of patients returned to work, 
11 retired because of disability, just couldn't do it. 5% retired because of age, and 3% were still on sick leave. Now, one of the weird things about this study is this. And this sounds like they didn't have a very good pituitary neurosurgeon, because in those with pituitary disease, uh, they had a relapse rate of 42%. And in the best of series, uh, it's more like 5%, maybe up to five, 25% within t five years. So I think there was some bias in this study. I think it's unheard of to see a 42% relapse rate nowadays from our expert pituitary neurosurgeons. So this just shows improvement, though. Uh, on the left, we're discussing here weakness, fatigue, and depression. So this was before treatment and after treatment, the percent of patients who had all this. Nobody went down to zero, but things at least improved. So we don't want to have unrealistic expectations. Um, this is a, another study looking at patients who had adrenalectomy for Cushing's. And they had 46 patients to respond. <clears throat> I think I like this study because it goes into details about what improved. So um, the first column is the percent of patients who had the symptoms before treatment and how many had a resolution. So in this study, only 20% had acne, but 100% got better and went away with good treatment. The facial plethora was only present in two-thirds, but it got better or resolved in 94%. So one other thing that was very impressive was that the diabetes went away in 70%. More of the symptoms, the purple stria got better or went away in three-quarters of the patients. Depression not totally resolved, only 68% of patients. High blood pressure went away in 67%. So you know what these, these numbers show me? Of the variability in recovery parameters, not everybody is back to their normal self. We've been saying that all day, but it's important that it be understood because I think some people are more frustrated with themselves because they're not back to their ideal self right away. Um, this is another study, effective treatment, looking at 39 patients who had their adrenals removed because their pituitary surgery was not successful. And this is what they did, these health surveys. And so this is after removal of both adrenals. 89% said they had improvement in their symptoms. 92% said that, yes, they would go through bilateral adrenalectomy again. And this is a different SF study, but they said the physical scores, 55% uh, and 81% of the mental, mental scores were in the top two-thirds of the normal population. In other words, things got better, but were not perfect. And this is an NIH study that I have some real criticism of. I wish Dr. Ophiel were still here because he was at the NIH when this was done. Um, but what they did is they mailed out questionnaires. And they, and the, the problem with the study was it included people who were in remission, patients with previous recurrence, some with persistent disease, and some who believed they weren't cured. And there was absolutely no information on whether, what their cortisol production was. Did these people have active disease or not? So anyway. It's just a problem. But it was, <clears throat> there are some good things about the study. They used the SF36, and they remember that normal is 50, the normal population score. So this is after treatment. Mental score was up close to 47, but the physical summary was still down here around 45. And asking were they satisfied with the outcome? Extremely satisfied, only 57%. Quite satisfied, a quarter. Moderately, nine. Slightly, four. 
not satisfied at all, 2%. Could be worse. So the limitations I mentioned, that there was no information on the hormone status of these people. Um, but this shows their SF36 stores looking at different groups, those who had a previous recurrence, those who had persistent, and those were not cured. So again, 50 is normal. And you can see that the mental summary was somewhere around about 43, physical around probably 37. And it, they're pretty similar. There's not much difference. But nobody's at 50. So the conclusion is that the amount of recovery is variable. Some patients do not return to their pre Cushing's level. Some patients do not have complete reversal of all their symptoms. Some don't return to work, and some feel that their quality of life is worse. However, I, I, it's half glass empty, half glass full sort of thing. Despite all this, and some people have long-lasting effects, there are people who rev go back to their normal selves. And it's a testimonial to their medical care, their efforts, their genetics, who knows what it is. But we do have people that come back to my clinic and I would don't recognize them because they look nothing like they did when they had Cushing's. So the amount of recovery is variable. And actually, the majority of patients do get back to their pre-Cushing's. They return to work, have improvement in their quality in life, and get on with it. <clears throat> so this is the summary. I think we have a lot more to do in this realm. One thing I mentioned earlier today, I think people try to think, I can do this on my own. Get over it. And you can't. It takes support of your family, your physicians. And once again, if depression is an important component, I wouldn't be too anxious to get off of medications for depression. Because then you've got a double challenge, the physical and the emotional recovery, that maybe the antidepressant would help. What's her quality of life? She's back to work. This is her full-time job. Thank you for your attention.